Yep, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We'll try that again. Uh, I'm Chair uh, Representative Jim Daphne. I have the privilege of chairing the House Education Finance Committee, and I want to welcome everyone uh, here in person as well as on Zoom to the K-12 Education Conference Committee for the year. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, wanted to uh, review that uh, we're focused on House File 4300 for this conference committee. <coughs> Uh, and we'll be exploring different aspects of that bill. Today, as, as you can tell, the House has the gavel. Uh, we are set to uh, work today until 10.50 to accommodate the Senate's floor schedule, as I understand it. Uh, we've got a fairly tight timeline uh, with a number of testifiers here uh, with a focus today on student and staff mental well-being and mental health in the schools coming from the House uh, proposal. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. We do have a 1030 hard stop on our side, so we'll have to be done by then. Well, then we'll have to be briefer. All right. Um, I'd ask, uh, let's see, Mr. Lee, would you please call the roll of the House members? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rep, Rep. Jim Davney? Pre present. Rep. Ruth Rich Richardson? Present. Rep. Sandstead? Present. Rep. Hassan? Present. Rep. Erickson? Present. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Ms. Donovan, would you please call the roll of the Senate? Senator Chamberlain? Here. Senator Eichhorn? Present. Senator Coleman? Present. Senator Duckworth? Here. Senator Weaker? Here. All right. Thank you, Ms. Donovan. Um, Members, uh, this is a slightly different uh, crew than last year's conference committee. I would just want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, so if you just do a very brief introduction as to your uh, legislative district and your school district or districts, uh, just to get us started. Representative Erickson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, District 15A, which is in East Central Minnesota, all of Mille Lacs County, parts of Kennebec and Sherburn. Uh, my school districts. My school district, district. Sorry, sorry about, about those who are on Zoom. Zoom. Oh, I guess I, I have, have to get, to get, get rid, rid of that. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. F1. F1. Uh, my, uh, school my school district. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, this is interesting. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Sandra Erickson, uh, representing 15A, which is uh, East Central Minnesota, uh, all of Mille Lacs County, parts of Kennebec and Sherburn. So my school districts begin with Elk River, primarily Zimmerman, and then uh, flow north. So it's a Princeton, Malacca, Onamia, Isle, uh, Ogilvy, but I have students uh, who attend Mora, Foley, Piers, and I think I even have some open enrolled in St. Michael Albertville. So uh, I keep tabs on a lot of kids. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Representative Hassan. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rep. Hassan, uh, Horden Hassan representing District 62A and School District Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Sandstead. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Julie Sandstead, I represent District 6A. Um, my districts are in Hibbing, Chisholm, Nashua, Kiwat, and Big Fork, um, Floodwood, and a good, good chunk of the Iron Range. Thank you, Representative Sandstead. Representative Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I represent just I represent uh, District 52B, and the school districts I represent are uh, independent school districts 196, 197, and 199. Thank you, Chair Richardson. I'm Representative Jim Davney. I represent uh, House District 63A in South Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Public Schools. Chair Chamberlain. Good morning. I represent Senate District 36 and uh, Centennial School District, White Bear Lake School District, parts of Forest Lake. Um, and a small part of Noka Hennepin. Uh, used to have a little bit of Stillwater, but I think they went away with uh, Delwood. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Coleman. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia Coleman. I represent Senate District 47, which is most of Parker County. And I have students uh, attending uh, several different school districts, I believe up to 14, but the biggest districts within my community are Minnetonka, 112, and Waconia. Thank you, Senator. Senator Duckworth. Uh, well, good morning, uh, Senator Duckworth, District 58. I represent uh, Lakeville Schools, which is why I'm not there first yet. I had to drop off my little ones this morning. Also, Farmington Schools, Randolph Schools, and a portion of Egan Apple Valley Rosemont. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't. Uh, Ms. Donovan, is Senator Icorn with us, or is he? Uh, Senator Icorn? I am on. Good morning. Uh, Senator Justin Icorn, District 5. I uh, task at Cass, Beltrami counties. I also have several school districts, but the biggest two being uh, both Bemidji and Grand Rapids school districts. Thank you very much. And Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I represent Senate District 43, suburban Ramsey, Washington counties, and I have four districts which are all or part of that. That includes North St. Paul, Maplewood, Oakdale, White Bear Lake, Roseville, and Matamita High School districts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And Chair Chamberlain, the, the House wanted to uh, start today and start this conference committee with uh, what we saw as uh, one of the most significant issues this year, and that's student well-being and mental health. And we've got a, a uh, lengthy uh, and, and comprehensive list of testifiers, but I wanted to open it up with some brief uh, comments from the three chairs whose committees all worked on this and start with Chair Richardson. If you would please. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Just quick, is there? Yes. An, do we have an agenda or no? Is it? Do we have one? We we can get you a copy of the agenda. My apologies. No, we don't have. Oh, okay. my apologies. Well, can we have copies for my sure. for the Senate staff? Uh, Senate Senate side. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Lee. Thank you. We'll work on that. All right. I didn't you. realize that hadn't happened. Thank you for asking. Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be brief. Um, I think it's fitting that we're start, starting talking about uh, mental health and student well-being as it's Mental Health uh, Awareness Month. Uh, we know that one of the common themes that we were hearing the entire session from educators, from students, and from administrators was the need for lifelines and supports for both educators and for students. And I just want to really lift up the fact that this is not the first time that we're hearing about the need for support. This has been something that has been longstanding. And um, one of the uh, hearings that we had in policy really hit home when we were talking about um, testifiers that had come in over a decade ago um, asking for lifelines and, and asking for help. And so I think it's really important that we understand that over the last two uh, decades, deaths by suicide within the United States have increased 33%. Uh, right now, the estimates are somewhere between one and six. Uh, kids between six and 17 have a mental health issue. So it's a very important topic, and I thank you for opening with this today, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Richardson. Uh, and Mr. Chair and, and members, uh, as Chair Richardson, Richardson identified, this is a long-term concern. Uh, our colleagues in Health and Human Services for a number of years have funded school link mental health services, now available in almost every county uh, in the state, if not every county. Um, that's been critical for students who need clinical level services. Uh, we've done past uh, investments in student support personnel because as we know, Minnesota uh, ranks near the bottom in the ratios between all the various uh, school support personnel classifications, counselors, social workers, uh, school psychologists, uh, chemical dependency folks, and school nurses. Uh, so we've made some investments in the past. We've also made some targeted investments with our level four students, uh, the most critical. Uh, those have, investments have been made in the past. We're looking in the, on the house side to uh, reinvigorate those and expand them to uh, all of our level four uh, students across the state because they are in many respects uh, our most needy and we saw the tragedy in Richfield earlier this year. 
Uh, we also propose, uh, because we believe our concern is for all students in the state, extend public school counselor services to private school elementary students. As you know, Mr. Chair, currently uh, private secondary schools receive public school counseling services. This would extend that same service to elementary students. Um, so we think we've got a strong package here today, but we start with the youngest, where the connection between student well-being and family well-being is perhaps the, the clearest. And we're joined today to review that with by Chair Pinto of the, our, our Early Childhood Committee. Thank you, Chair Pinto, for joining us today. Thank you, Chair Davney. Thank, Thank you, Chair Chamberlain. Oh, Chair. Uh, Chair Chamberlain. The Senate is also present. I thought I was going to get a minute or two to open up as well. Oh, we, we can certainly do that. Let's, let's let uh, Chair Chamberlain, or excuse me, Chair Pinto, your Chair Chamberlain, uh, <laughs> complete the mental health uh, discussion here before we launch into testifiers. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and everybody who's in attendance and watching. We've, uh, take, we also agree that this is an important issue, um, and the Senate has taken steps. We recognize several things. One is that mental health issues are always, uh, problems are always a challenge and were prior to COVID and the shutdowns uh, and also prior to social media. So we've taken an approach of understanding this from a different perspective, understanding that it is there and it is serious. I agree with uh, Chair Richardson about the suicides and the depression. So I, I see it as a progression pre-social media then we had social media. Social media has been tied to a lot of problems. I've spoken to parents who have lost children because of, um, they claim, the, the uh, hazards and risks and uh, problems with social media. So we took steps last year to begin addressing that scourge on our culture and our kids and our society. We got a couple million dollars to support a great organization to build a model that can be used in schools across the state. Educators uh, have told me personally and in groups that social media, the screens are probably the biggest problem they face in their classrooms and the distractions they cause. So secondly, you pile onto that the disruptions of the last couple of years. Um, that added tremendous stress to our children and to our educators. Um, those are unfor that's an unforced error on the schools and the kids, and they've had to deal with that. Um, we have claimed for some time that the, one of the best things to be done is to get back to normal and get in those schools and um, get some normalcy and stability for the schools. To that end, that was our position last year, and it's a position this year. No mandates, no extra burdens, and uh, let them stabilize, innovate, and create and get back to normal. Finally, um, I would say reading has been a problem. If you can't read, you're gonna have problems in school. We all know that 50% of our kids aren't reading at grade level. They become disruptive, behavioral problems, and um, eventually probably drop out of school, and sadly, many of them end up in the criminal justice system. So our approach has been to stabilize, address the core problem of social media, to um, uh, address reading, and um, <coughs> uh, find, and what we've done is we have safe schools, money set aside for this purpose that can be used for counselors and uh, various other things as many of you are aware of. We also, Senator Rosen's bill with um, uh, school-linked money for uh, support, and finally, there is simply a math problem here. Um, you cannot simply go out and pluck uh, a couple few thousand certified, credible professionals out of off a tree and expect them to step into the role. We have shortages across this state in every profession, and mental health is no uh, exception to that. So we're committed to addressing this. I think there. Are uh, positive actions we can take, but also uh, the other things we began last year to address these issues. The quicker we stabilize and normalize, quick, uh, quicker we address social media issues and take it seriously, and finally, um, reading, then we'll go a long way to settle 
and address those things. We can complement that with those other things I mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. That was, that was insightful, and I do appreciate your taking the time. Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Chamberlain, members of the Conference Committee. Uh, as the Chair referenced, there's a real link between little kids uh, and their families uh, when it comes to mental health. And so what this bill contains is $2.5 million per year in funding for school social workers to help support not only young kids who are experiencing mental health issues as others, as the older kids are as well, but also for their families. If you think back to the time when your children were really young, that probably was one of the most stressful times of your lives, and that's true for most families as well, and for the people doing this critical work who are, um, tend to be with the youngest kids, are the lowest paid, uh, and the uh, fewest benefits, and experiencing some of the biggest challenges. Um, so I want to just emphasize that the needs for well-being and for mental health extend to the youngest kids as well and to their families, and I'm proud um, for this connection uh, here. And I wish you the very best uh, as you do your work over the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Chair Pinto, and thank you to the Early Childhood Committee for your contribution to House File 4300. I'd like uh, now to transfer to our testifiers. We've got uh, a number of, of practitioners, students, uh, and school administrators today to share their different perspectives. And I'd like to start with Dr. Ann Garrity from the Department of Psychiatry and Be Behavioral Sciences at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Garrity, welcome to the uh, committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Ann Garrity. Please um, proceed. Thank, thank you for having me. I've been asked very briefly to give you an overview and, and um, your Leaders have already done some of my work. Um, many years ago, when I was a new clinician at Children's Hospital, it had just opened, and I was there working on early childhood. And um, the, the ethos was, the, the belief was, that all of our children could have serious illnesses, but only those kids could have mental health problems. This stigma remains with bias, not only towards children, but towards their family. One truth that we have learned is that mental health is as universal as physical health and as potentially devastating and potentially treatable. Um, what I'd like to do is quickly go through some of the research as is in the public press. So this is very well known and identified these last two years. Um, I'm gonna read headlines. Nations youth swamped with severe mental health crisis experts say. This is an article in the Washington Post in 10, uh, October 21. In 2020, mental health crisis was particularly acute. According to the CDC, um, it had increased 24% for children 5 to 11 and 31% for children 12 to 17. The su su suspected suicide attempts had increased, increased as much as 50% as um, Representative Richardson mentioned. There was a shortage of available care, especially in psychiatry, and this shortage was acute. Um, we know that we had way too few resources for children's needs, and this had um, devastating effects, not just to children in crisis, but also for children who, because they lost mental health care, became more egregiously ill and, in fact, dangerous sometimes to themselves and others. The second article, there is a mental health crisis among American children, and the pandemic is not the only reason. Um, in December, when the Surgeon General noted a mental health crisis, he made clear that the rising numbers um, had occurred before COVID-19. Between 2013 and 2019, anxiety and ADHD were the most common mental disorders among those 3 to 17. Again, I support Chair Pinto in saying we need to look sooner. Um, with each condition um, affecting 1 in 11 children, however, 1 in 5 children aged 12 to 17 uh, excuse me, um, 12 to 17, experienced a major depressive disorder. Now, that's really important <clears throat> to consider that at 12, as adolescent begins, there's more vulnerability to a disorder that has to do with energy and self 
um, uh, confidence and confidence, a collapse. Um, and in 2019, fewer than 15% of children received um, some kind of mental health help. Um, we also know that um, the underserved needs of minority children is particularly striking. And I'd like to suggest, since this is a school uh, meeting, that we consider that many of the children who are in level four programming are um, children with unmet and often unidentified mental health concerns. Third article, it's life or death, the mental health crisis among American teens. This article is in the New York Times and started with a story about a 13-year-old girl in suburban Minnesota. It noted that earlier generations had binge drinking, teen pregnancies, and driving under the influence, and that um, these markers are now down. However, um, depression and anxiety markers are up. So rather than acting out, children are more exploding in which is problematic for me as a clinician because acting out, at least we can see more. Exploding in is a lot harder sometimes to see. Why is this changed? First is that there is changing neurobiological maturation. Adolescence is not just cultural. This is not just that we let kids grow up slower. We know from neural um, MRI imaging and other researching that puberty is happening earlier than it was decades before. The average age of puberty is now 11, with many children starting puberty at, at 9 or 10, and their bodies are not ready for the demands of adolescence. The brain needs more time to learn complex biological and psychosocial um, complexities. One author talked about the, acceler the accelerator pressed down to the floor before a good braking system is in place. Social media input um, with ex without expanded social reasoning has certainly exacerbated this problem, but I want to be careful. The research does not support that social media is only the bad guy. For many kids, social media has also been a help. So it's a complex picture. We know that expanding social media is um, part of our lives. By 2019, 95% of American teens had a smartphone. Um, the volume of input, especially during COVID, increased because there was nothing else. For some, social media was a lifeline during COVID. Um, it really helped keep kids connected. For some, social media amplified negative feelings. So again, there's complexity. It's so appealing to find simple solutions or simplistic solutions. The third reason that there seems to be difficulty is this uh, loneliness is a predictor of depression and anxiety. And there's been such a change in how social activities are experienced and valued within our culture. You'll remember that book about a decade alone about um, bowling um, and the, the, the collapse of social um, engagement around usual things. This has been particularly difficult for our youth and teens. Our youth, yes, video games have replaced board games. Um, there was a burst of board games at the beginning of COVID when families had energy to play. But that collapsed, and the video games have really become a way that kids are socializing, but not face-to-face. -face. Um, funding for community activities have really diminished. Who goes to camp these days? Wealthy kids. So we really have lost a lot of our community activities. So some of the social media is not causing that loss, but filling in a gap that we need to think about. The fourth reason is parents are overwhelmed with economic demands. There's reduced bandwidth to know their kids. There's pressure to perform. Pressure for academic achievement in school is really up. And five, five the pain of mental health comes from acting out and often rejecting positive or pro-social interactions. So we see more kids becoming estranged 
from the values of their family, even some of the values of their peers. There's a, a degree of isolation that we're very alarmed for about. The fourth article I think is very important. We have essentially turned a blind eye to our own children for decades. Why we need to stop politicizing children's mental health. This again was in the Washington Post, February 2022. We are suffering from a crisis that until recently, this is a quote, people didn't care, dare to speak about. We have essentially turned a blind eye to our own children for decades. And now we see this escalation. I appreciate um, Chair Pinto's comment about the pay levels for daycare providers and early childhood providers. We've seen a collapse of our services um, increasingly from the time I started in mental health till now. Um, uh, um, Representative um, Dagny talked about clinical level services. I think of community, clinical, and prevention. And we're not going to succeed if we only look at clinical. We need to look at community and prevention services. COVID has exacerbated what many children and teens are struggling to manage. The social safety um, uh, of school and community were good band-aids, which permitted many children to manage um, and to feel supported or distracted from some of their internal stress. This, this finding I thought was very important. Seven months into the pandemic, in, in October 20, a study in the journal Pediatrics revealed that 27% of parents said their mental health was worsening in the early days of the pandemic. That was much higher than the 14% who said their children's behavioral health had gotten worse. So what we need to be looking at is parent stress as well as child stress. Those of us in mental health know that as the parents are not able to support, the child is left to their own immature resources. Dr. Garrity, yes. unfortunately, I do need you to, to wrap up, if you could, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'll say a couple of things. We know that the disparities are very significant. Children of color are receiving much less services. We know that nationally, the payment system for, um, for um, psychiatry and mental health is the lowest of the medical professions. And let me just say a few words on COVID, all right? The, the effects of COVID. COVID quarantine has reduced or eliminated many of the safety net community um, protections. We know that lack of social connections with peers and adults have put massive strain on parents. We know that COVID has also taxed children's learning. We know that some children did well with virtual, some did not. Fear of the future has been made more fraught by the current political mood. Imagine how um, children can make sense of our social culture right now. Social cohesion is shaky at best and for many shattered. And this won't be an easy fix. Coming back to normal isn't happening. This is an opportunity for schools to think differently and with innovation. One of the concerns that I have is that there is too little community story that permits us to feel like we made it. Um, teachers are panicking. There's pressure to get kids back to learning. This is the really important point I wanna make. Kids are being forced to make up rather than rediscover the pleasure of learning. Pleasure of learning, why is this so important? 30 years of research about trauma, toxic stress, and learning pedagogies have made us realize that positive emotions and positive motivation are more likely to facilitate positive outcome. Skills paired with pride go a long way to maintaining mastery. And parents need permission for this too, to see their children as succeeding in school in ways broader than just grades. Dr. Garrity, that's a, that's a great ending for us, succeeding in school beyond just grades. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Uh, we will be, uh, because of the, the shortened timeline, we will be needing to extend uh, today's testimony on student well-being and mental health into Wednesday's hearing. 
but I wanted to move next to uh, Commissioner Mueller. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Good morning, conference committee members. And my name is Heather Mueller, and I am the Commissioner of Education. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you about the dire need for mental health supports for our students and our educators. Last time I came before the House to speak on this matter, I acknowledged the senseless tragedy that occurred in District 287 and the impact felt not only in their school community, but also in the Richfield School District and community and around the state. I'm glad that Superintendent Lewandowski is here to, again today to continue advocating for the ongoing need for mental health support. Our students, staff, families, and school communities deserve better. Schools are more than building the building themselves. Schools are the people who are in there every single day to build relationships and learn and teach. The safety, health, and wellness of our students and staff continues to be our utmost priority, and it is incumbent upon us that this first meeting about the Education Conference Committee is focusing on this dire need. We've heard many proposals in the House hearings, and it is my hope that the whole committee benefits from this conversation today that will highlight the needs from our students, our educators, our families, and our communities, and the solutions that are presented by both the House and the Governor. The mental health of our students is not ancillary to our students' learning. It is of equal importance to their academic learning. There was a time in education when the only focus was what happened in the classroom could be summed up in a song, reading, writing, and arithmetic. What happened outside the school building had little to no impact on what happened inside the school building, where the hub of the wheel was actually the community and the community outsets and supports were the very first to know and to respond to students and families in need, and the school was a support to that response. Today, our schools have become the hub of the wheel. They tend to be the first to know when students and families are in need, provide immediate supports when possible, and connect families and students to community assets. Everything that we have learned, everything that we know about education through research and evidence-based practices clearly articulates that what happens outside of the school building has an impact on what happens inside the school building. While the contents of the song about what happens in schools continues to be true, the time of siloing and isolating the academic learning of our students from their mental health no longer exists. Frankly, siloing and isolating students' academic learning from their mental health is a relic practice that has no place in education. As a society, we have readily acknowledged that in our education system, students who have in addition to's included with their general education student status need has a more diverse approach to resources. A general education student who is also experiencing homelessness, a general education student who also needs special education services, a general education student who needs English learner services, a general education who needs free or reduced priced meals. You all get my point. However, designating resources to support a general education student who also needs mental health services continues to be an invisible in addition to, and it makes no sense. The research tells us that students coping with mental health concerns negatively impacts their ability to meet the many demands of schools, including cognitive demands for learning, social emotional demands for making friends and behaving according to school rules, norms, and expectations, and the physical demands for being active throughout the school day. We know that outside of our students' homes, if they're lucky enough to have homes. Schools are the most likely place where mental health concerns will be detected because they spend most of their day at school interacting with adults and their peers. As early as 1989, the Carnegie Council Task Force on Education for Young Adults um, said, school systems are not responsible for meeting every need of their student, but when the need directly affects learning, the school must meet the challenge. More recently, the Every Student Succeeds Act acknowledged the direct link between mental health and school outcomes and placed an unprecedented priority on wraparound supports for young people struggling with barriers to learn, including programs that address mental health, school climate, violence, prevention, and trauma. Reading is one indicator, and it's a very important indicator, but we know that we cannot equate reading and mental health. Reading and behavior is one thing. Reading and mental health is another, and we cannot conflate the two. When school leaders have the resources and the time that they need to commit to addressing and meeting the mental health needs of our students, not only do the students themselves thrive, but also the entire school community thrives. Actually, our communities in general thrive. We know that students who receive appropriate mental health supports have improved academic achievement, are more likely to graduate, and are more likely to attend and successfully complete college or enter into the workforce. 
There are a range of supports in the House and Governor's budgets that I implore this conference committee to adopt, including expanding current student support personnel and providing the access to recruiting, retention, and the diversification of our student support personnel. You will hear from students and practitioners today and on Wednesday that will speak to the great need, and please heed their advice. When we know better, we can do better, and we must do better. We have known better for a very long time, and our students can't wait any longer for us to figure this out. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, for starting off this conference committee with this incredibly important topic. Thank you, Commissioner Mueller. Appreciate it. Next testifier, Keila Coolers from the St. Paul Music Academy, where she is a uh, school counselor. Welcome to the committee. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Members, my name is Keila Coolers. I am the 2022 Minnesota School Counselor of the Year. I've been a school counselor for over a decade. Most of my career has been in urban K through five elementary schools. I'm also a proud parent of an elementary age student who attends a Minnesota public school. In preparation for today's testimony about mental health with our youngest students, I contemplated detailing to you about how across this school year, I've completed more self-harm risk assessments with students than any other previous school year in my career. I could have chosen to illustrate stories that have resulted in me making more referrals to therapeutic services in the community in the past five months than in the past five years combined. Yes, I could have chosen to talk about those stories. They are true and they matter. But when those are the only stories that are told about the experience of young students, it portrays a limited understanding of mental health. Mental health in its most Simple definition is the human response to emotions triggered by life circumstances. And those responses are on a spectrum from healthy to maladaptive, reinforced by a variety of individual and environmental variables. By this definition, mental health is not just the experience of those with a medical diagnosis. Mental health is a human experience, and responding to life's ups and downs in a healthy way is an essential life skill. Everyone experiences mental health including kids. Mental health in elementary schools does look like the stories I mentioned before, but what it also looks like is the student who has trouble focusing for weeks in writing because of cyberbullying they experience outside the school day and are afraid to tell anyone. Or the student who continuously draws or doodles on math assignments because he doesn't believe he's smart enough, so he gives up and assignment after assignment goes uncompleted or the student who takes frequent trips to the bathroom every day because of stomach aches caused by anxiety during reading. You see, mental health is not just for students with extreme circumstances or diagnosis. It presents itself in a variety of invisible ways for Minnesota students every day. And the needs have exponentially exploded in the continued track waves of COVID. Without the opportunity for students to have these experiences and emotions normalized and equip them with practice strategies to cope with them early on in their education, every one of those students will experience learning loss that could, may likely compound to have a negative impact on their academic achievement in the long run. Most Minnesota elementary schools create an equation in response to student mental health with social workers, school psychologists, behavior intervention staff with limited training or formal education on mental health, or they contract with outside community therapeutic agencies. Those roles are seen as equally interchangeable. And I know from my past experience working as a therapist and a social caseworker in a community agency, that work is absolutely valuable and needed. Those roles often carry <clears throat> work with students in only small group or individual counseling settings. They carry a caseload of students who were referred by a teacher or guardian. They do miraculous work with students after an identified need, mental health diagnosis, or behavioral concern is present. But the key in that sentence is after there is an identified need or concern. And while elementary school counselors also provide those services, we do additional work in schools that are markedly different than those aforementioned roles. One of the significant ways that I will highlight where elementary school counselors are uniquely different is that we proactively teach classroom lessons. At my school, we are in front of all of our over 500 students every single week, all year long. In those lessons, we cover a wide scope of social, emotional, and interpersonal skills. We learn about how our body changes when we have big feelings. 
We learn about the brain and we laugh at the silly word, the amygdala, the feelings part of our brain, right in the back, that unless we use strategies to keep it calm and under control, it will turn off the thinking part of our brain. Yes, you see where I might be going here. Experiences with strong emotions actually turn off our ability to use higher level thinking. And yes, students as young as five and six learn about their brain this way. We talk about naming our feelings and we expand our emotions vocabulary. We learn all the creative ways to take deep breaths from five finger breath to the cooking candle breath and blowing up imaginary rainbow colored balloons in our bellies. We explore calming tools that we can use on the bus, the lunchroom, at recess, in the classroom, during a test, or at home. And we practice and practice those strategies so they are available to us even in the storm of an activated amygdala. Another notably unique action that school counselors take is we annually comb through school-wide data as a part of our standard practice. We disaggregate reading, writing, and math student data. The result is targeted school counseling interventions that target and address student achievement and opportunity gaps. As an example this year, I have a small group <coughs> intervention with students who are below grade level in reading and have participated in two or more literacy interventions in the past. They are not students with mental health diagnoses. They are not acting out and receiving discipline write-ups, and they are not chronically absent. But they lack self-esteem and confidence in themselves as readers. They gave up when it got too hard. Their mental health is impacting their reading achievement. In my work with them, we learn about topics like grit and positive self-talk. We learn about test anxiety, and we practice ways to be assertive and ask for help. All of these skills build student capacity to better engage and focus on their reading lessons with their teacher. They learn strategies to overcome barriers to learning. And the goal and result was despite previous reading interventions that still left them behind, students all experienced increased reading achievement on their standardized tests after this small group counseling intervention because they learned about their mental health. Because now they are equipped with self-confidence in themselves that they will continue to carry on with them throughout their educational journey. The thing that's significant about this point is that schools can buy the best research-based reading curriculum out there, put all the resources into cutting-edge math, or invest in technology to engage learners. But the rea reality is that none of that will work unless students are able to understand their mental health and cope with strong emotions first. It simply doesn't work the other way around. Because unless students have the tools and strategies to manage their mental health, their brain simply, by primal design and function, literally will not be able to actively attend to or retain learning, no matter how phenomenal the reading curriculum is. But the good news is that with the unique preventative work that elementary school counselors bring, when they are part of the school's equation to support mental health, all students feel empowered with tools to recognize and respond to their mental health in a safe and healthy way. All kids are equipped with needed mindsets and behaviors to take on learning challenges. All students are confident in themselves as learners before the firestorm of adolescence and all of its layers that it adds to life's complexity. Understanding and managing our mental health is an essential life skill. Minnesota elementary age students deserve to have the opportunity to build those skills and have access to a school counselor from the start of their education. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Ms. Coolers. Appreciate that. Uh, next up is Jerome Treadwell, Executive Director of Minnesota Teen Activists. And just a heads up, uh, on deck is Jason Wynn from Spring Lake Park High School. But Mr. Treadwell, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Jerome Treadwell. I'm the Executive Director, as mentioned, of Minnesota Teen Activists. Um, we are the largest student-led social organization in the state of Minnesota. Um, our mission statement is to eradicate systemic injustices in schools. I'm also a high schooler at Highland Park senior, um, high school senior this year. Um, but one thing about Minnesota teen activists is that we don't just respond to injustices that occur, but also to the effect um, that happen to those children, our peers who experience these injustices. That is their mental health, right? So it is unfortunate here today 
um, that we have to compare and contrast and have all these ideologies and these philosophies and these statistics and we understand that the conversation should not move away from uh, the actuality of what's happening in our classrooms. And one thing that I can consider is that we've been tired of talking about race to the extent that you no longer ask, how are the children? But today I've come to uh, share with you all that the student body, we're no longer you know, begging for a seat at the table uh, just so that, uh, can you all see me here? We can, thank you for okay. turning on your camera. We're no longer here uh, begging for a seat at the table just so that we can uh, ha have our voices heard. We're, we're demanding that you don't just see us uh, and hear us, but you listen to us. If, if we are content with kids, we'll just be kids and we'll be content with a failing society and we'll be content with increasing poor mental health rates from the Democrats who come with too many flowers and get bags and the Republicans who come with so much pride and strife. Um, I come to propose to you a new party. It's called Gen Z. It's a time where we uh, want to incorporate the race conversation and, and not have it removed from the bills that we propose through our nation that have been successfully passed. But it's time that we do something about this. It's time that we move away from the Jim Crow of the North. And, and I urge you not to drop the ball of this education package in the Senate, but rather be uh, more tangible uh, for the students and the people who don't look like you or experience the things like you. At Minnesota Teen Activists, we've received social media messages and emails and phone calls and text messages from students all across the state, as far as Big Lake to Duluth, as close as Roseville and St. Paul, and as low as Rochester, Minnesota. They who are countlessly ex experiencing these malicious and sadistic behaviors have really overwhelmed us, right? It's heartening that we've come to a place that the only hope that our peers have is within each other and not the lawmakers. We've gathered over 10,000 responses on a Google form of students who have experienced racism and bullying because of their race, religion, se or sexual orientation, economic status, or disabilities, which is far more comprehensive than any MDE survey. Why? Because we are also allowing the students to express themselves and to share in writing anonymously what they have experienced in detail. So lawmakers, today is the day to ask yourself that what if my child was in that position and I could single-handedly contribute to creating a law in which school boards would ensure that student safety in school, without a doubt, that matriculates to their mental health, ergo failing grades, uh, suicidal behavior, depression, isolation, et cetera. I've heard many of you, including Representative Erickson, say that it is not a place for politicians to tell the school boards what to do. So you mean to tell me the school boards that have been unsuccessful in ending the Asian racial conflict in St. Paul Public School Districts or the monkey chants and the N-words roaming around in New Prague area schools? I mean, the list goes on and on and on, right? So, so listen to this. The science has gone forth. The statistics have gone forth. I mean, the conversations have gone forth. And it's now time for our hearts to come together and pass Representative Hanson's F, uh, HF uh, 2360 bill to attribute to the education uh, and the eradication of our poor mental health and malicious and sadistic behavior in schools. Growing up, I went to Capitol Hill, gifted and talented magnet school. I was diagnosed with stuttering speech fluency by the first grade, and I experienced microaggressions and discrimination and struggled to make friends as one of the few non-white classmates. But what I would, con what I would consider you uh, to understand here today is that, that it's not it's not so much the, 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 uh, the, the, the excellent mind that these students have, but really it is how they per are perceived by our society in our classroom. I can tell you this because what one will consider acting out in class and, and being disruptive was simply me crying out to be accepted for who I am and to be treated with culturally competent resources. But instead, my mother, who, who uh, was urged to put me on Ritalin because they simply didn't know how to respond to me in the mental state of mind that I was in because of the environment that I was learning in. But she instead came from a place where she wanted to be strong and deny the urge for this medicinal babysitter and crutch and in a place where I have now been accepted to prestigious schools and received awards from Princeton University and Berkeley College of Music and the NAACP. And I'm simply grateful here today that Representative Hanson has put aside her whiteness so that minorities can experience greatness. And if we do not understand that this bill and this whole package here today is presented before us so that we can make a change in our society in the classrooms and eradicate the prison the pipeline, right, and eradicate the different mental health crisis from the suicidal, from the from all the different things and depression that I don't want to see my brothers and sisters, my peers, and my classmates go through when you all have it at the foot of 
your table. You have it at the palm of your hands to really create a, a place where our students can really thrive and really be in an awesome state of mind. So again, I really urge you to not so much have this ideology of that we need to separate school and state and that we need to let the school board members with the PhD do their things, but we also need to come to a place where it's blatantly presented in front of us and if we continue to ignore it, we continue to attribute to a society in which we will no longer, we will, we will stunt our growth. And in the words of Langston uh, Hughes, we will defer the dreams of young folks like myself. Thank you, Mr. Treadwell. So next up is Jason Wynn from Spring Lake Park High School. And on deck is Dr. Sanders from Hennepin County. Mr. Wynn, welcome to the uh, committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Jason Wynn. Good morning to the Senate Education Committee, representatives, fellow speakers, and viewers at home. I am Jason Wynn, a junior at Spring Lake Park High School. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to attend this meeting and speak on a very important issue. I came here today to speak about the necessity for Bill HR 3260, proposed through Just Hansen, and how through this, the adverse effects of racism and bullying on mental health and academic performance can be reduced. For a minute, I will be taking everyone back to high school. Imagine this. You're a junior in high school taking world history. You enter your class, and when you see one of your peers, you immediately get clammy. You want to leave this class immediately, and some days it gets so bad that you end up skipping to avoid this class. Who is this student, you may ask? That student is me, who has experienced firsthand how bullying affects mental health and academic performance. Because of my lack of attendance, I started missing assignments in world history, slowly but surely, and my grades started falling lower and lower. When I was in class, I was less likely to participate due to the fear of judgment from this student and the bullying I've endured from them, making my understanding of the course to pass. Many of my peers have felt the same way about the student, even some transferring out of class with them, which makes it even more important that this bill passes. If this bill passes, we can have more action taken towards bullying and prevent more of the negative impacts to create a better and safer space for our students, especially those who are minorities, which is what this bill is focusing on. If all of our students can feel safe within our schools, then we are making school the place it should be. No student should ever have to go to school afraid like I was. However, many more students as of recently have had to experience bullying through racism, affecting both their mental health and their academic performance. During COVID-19, many students, especially students who are Asian, experienced a lot of racism due to the fact that many COVID cases originated in Asia. This created a sense of fear in many of my peers, worrying that whenever they would go out, they would be beaten up, which in turn made my peers focused on worrying more about their families, causing their mental health to decline. They knew that they were not at fault for the pandemic, but felt as if they were because of the bullying they experienced. Also, through social media, mental health was further impacted when reports of anti-Asian hate crimes were posted, making it further known to my Asian peers that racism in our world had become violent, and they had to be even more careful. The academics of my peers also would take a decrease because of the amount of tension that they were putting on the pandemic as a whole and worrying about the consistent hate crimes and bullying students of their race would experience making it so much more important that we have regulations to prevent people bullying our students of color and establish stronger support systems for them to enhance not only their mental health, but also their ability to learn. These examples bring up the point. What would be the usefulness of defining anti-bullying language and creating more policies if bullying is so commonplace and has already had established norms? Bullying is a multifaceted experience, and it has expanded so much with the rise of social media. 
with new platforms for students to experience bullying and new methods people are using in order to bully, it is important that we come up with a more updated and consistent way to define bullying and combat it in order to protect these students through their mental health and keep their performance at school up. In conclusion, today I discussed the ways bullying and racism impacts mental health and academic performance and why we should enact not only stricter bullying policies, but also establish more support within our schools, through our counselors and our educators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Next up, uh, Dr. Sanders from Hennepin County and on deck is Dr. Nels, Jody Nelson from Change, Inc. But Dr. Sanders, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chairman, members of the committee. I am Dr. Mark Sander. I'm a clinical child psychologist and the director of school mental health for Hennepin County. I'm honored to speak to you today on the national and local crisis in children's mental health and what we can do uh, to support our youth, families, and schools. You've heard a lot about the statistics, so I will skip that and go right to, with everything that students and educators have gone through over the past two years, we really need to provide stable, predictable, safe, welcoming, and nurturing environments and different levels of mental health supports to meet all uh, the needs of students, families, and educators. We need to create an educational environment that can adapt to support youth and deliver mental health interventions to help students build social, emotional, and behavioral skills. The National Center for School Mental Health, along with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers, have developed an evidence-based approach called Comprehensive School Mental Health Systems that provide a framework for how schools can build these supportive and healing environments. So how do we build comprehensive school mental health systems to support all students and educators? In Minnesota, we have many, if not most of the tools that we need, but we need the funding so that schools can implement these evidence-based programs and practices. To start with, schools need training and support to implement positive behavior interventions and supports or multi-tiered systems of support as a way to organize the interventions and supports for students. PBIS and MTSS utilize a three-tiered system of support. Tier one supports are provided to universally to all students. Tier two supports are provided to some students who need a little additional help. And tier three supports are more uh, intensive and often individualized. At tier one, what do we need? We need educators to be trained in evidence-based programs and practices that build positive and nurturing school climate and culture. They need to be implementing programs such as responsive classroom, second step, and other social emotional learning and character development programs that have clear evidence of beneficial impact on mental health related outcomes. We also need to focus on adult social emotional learning so that educators can be their best to give their best to students and families. We need to have an option for universal mental health screening in order to be able to identify students who may need more support than tier one. And we heard that earlier. More mental health, more social emotional learning programming will improve student mental health and it will get to those students, right, who have not yet shown that they need support. At tier two, we need additional school employed student uh, professionals, such as school psychologists, school social workers, school counselors, and school nurses, to provide in the classroom social emotional learning and mental health supports, to deliver group interventions to help students develop skills to manage anxiety and depression, and build resiliency and, social, and pro-social skills. We need to utilize uh, restorative practices rather than punitive disciplinary actions to help students be held accountable while learning the consequences of their actions while still being able to be in school and have that positive connection with school. 
at tier three, we need a combination of school employed, student support professionals and community employed mental health professionals working together in schools to deliver evidence-based <clears throat> individualized mental health interventions. All right, we need more funding for both <clears throat> the student support personnel and the school linked mental health grants. The number of parents and caregivers trying to access mental health services for their students has exploded. And many times community-based agencies have three to four to six month waiting lists. Additional resources are needed urgently <clears throat> so that we can expand services by both our school employed and our community employed professionals in schools to meet the urgent needs of so many students. We also need alternatives to suspension so that students again can be held accountable without being isolated from their school community and missing important critical days of instruction. All three tiers need to be trauma informed, healing centered and culturally responsive. In order to achieve this, educators and school administrators need ongoing training and support about implementing these frameworks within their school climate and their school culture. In summary, in order to create <clears throat> environments which are nurturing, healing, and supportive for all youth, we need to, one, continue to provide funding and training in MTSS and PBIS. Two, we need to provide more training and coaching on student and adult social emotional learning. We need to implement trauma responsive healing centered supports in schools and provide training and ongoing consultation around these practices. We need to increase funding for student support staff. We need to increase school linked mental health funding. We need to provide restorative practices in schools and training on how to implement them. We need to increase training on alternative to suspensions and we need to offer school districts the option of opt-in mental health screening. I believe as the legislature provides funding for these eight priorities, schools will be able to implement a more robust, comprehensive school mental health system that will start alleviating the children's mental health crisis in Minnesota. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for that comprehensive overview. Next, uh, Dr. Nelson from Change, Inc. After, uh, after Dr. Nelson is Casey Gamage. Dr. Nelson, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'm Jody Nelson. I'm the Executive Director of Change, Inc., Chair and Committee Members. It's an honor to be with you this morning uh, to share my experiences in schools and with the well-being of students. Uh, my agency, Change Inc., uh, is a community-based organization, nonprofit. We have two uh, offices, one in northeast Minneapolis and one on the west side of St. Paul, uh, historically known as Guadalupe Alternative Programs. And currently, we are the uh, lead uh, for the DHS School Link Mental Health Grant uh, in uh, all of Ramsey County. We're also a community partner of the Minneapolis Public Schools and the St. Paul Public Schools and considered uh, in both districts, we're in about 35 schools providing uh, school-linked mental health services as well as in-school mentoring uh, services as well. So based on that work, um, you know, historically my agency has been around for uh, since the mid 60s and 1960s. And um, what we've been about all that time is removing barriers to success for young people and primarily uh, focused on school success. We have a basic understanding that uh, you're gonna be you know, set up best for life success if you've been successful in school. So really, how do we remove those barriers? And particularly in the Twin City area, barriers that are often uh, caused at the intersection of poverty and racism. Uh, so that has been our work, uh, addressing risk factors and then also supporting and boosting resilience by paying attention to protective factors. And one of the things that we know is the number one protective factor in the life of a young person is a caring adult. So uh, one of the things I just wanna 
uh, put out here for this committee is this metaphor. Uh, if you ever remember flying, um, and maybe you have, have uh, taken the risk to do so lately, but as you get your pre-flight instructions from the flight attendant at the front of the plane, and they're showing you uh, how to have a o oxygen mask drop down and place it upon your face, the instruction is always, if you're traveling with children, is that the adult is to put the oxygen mask on their fa face first. And that is a metaphor that has hung with me as I think about uh, the well-being of children. I think about, well, what's, how is the well-being of adults? Uh, do the adults got it? Uh, both in their home and at school and in the community and in the and in the world. And if the adults have the oxygen mask placed on their face and they are doing well, then the chance that children will thrive is greater. So what I would urge this committee to do in all the all the various proposals and all the various things that you can um, that you can propose and put money towards, I, I number one would would recommend that you put money towards supporting the adults in the lives of children. Uh, particularly for this committee in, in school staff. I will say it, that we've had two difficult years. Uh, it was not that easy before the pandemic. The first year of the pandemic, we all went on adrenaline in terms of uh, pivoting to distance learning and in the clinical world, pivoting to telehealth. But this last year, I've heard from many, many adults in the lives of kids that it's been a very, very difficult year in terms of um, all of the uncertainty and all of the um, in and out and back and forth that we've all had to do. So, so how do we support uh, caregivers? Uh, we have a small grant from the Minneapolis Public Health Department called Care for the Caregivers, in which we're looking to support um, teachers by just showing affirmation and appreciation, small moments of self-care. And I, I would encourage you to join that, um, that kind of movement about care for the caregivers. So support for school staff. Secondly, would be all the things that have been mentioned about support for caregiver for guardians and parents. They, uh, particularly at the early childhood level, we have the great opportunity to work with early childhood special ed in Minneapolis, and uh, have been able to provide uh, through a small grant brief counseling services up to six sessions, but just to for a parent to be able to get some added support. So, um, so just you know, join us in that kind of support for parents and caregivers. And then the third thing I would I would just uh, recommend is that we need more adults. Uh, uh, we need more caring adults out here. And it, and I think just in terms of you know I, I like I said have probably fifty um, uh, professionals that are working in schools and keeping you know uh, attracting them and retaining them and supporting them uh, uh, in this uh, era of workforce shortages is a challenge. So um, you know join me in in being able to. Um, you know, attract people to the field and uh, retain folks. And uh, and uh, someone mentioned earlier, it doesn't need to be everybody a master's degree license on uh, clinical help. It can really be uh, bringing in community members. I'm thinking, is isn't there something like the Gray Panthers where we need to bring more grandparents into the schools? Um, we 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 really need to just we need more adults. We need more hands on deck. Um, so thank you. And good thank luck. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, next, Casey Gamage, and then we'll uh, shift to Superin Superintendent Lewandowski. Um, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Casey Gamage, and I'm a licensed associate marriage and family therapist. I've worked at a, as a domestic violence relief advocate at Harriet Tubman, which is a battered women's shelter, for the past 12 years. I'm also a wraparound supervisor at Change, Inc., as well as a mental health practitioner providing individual and group support at Edison High School, go Tommies. And just because I'm not busy enough, I started my dissertation for my PhD. Shortly after the murder of George Floyd on May 25th, a colleague of mine approached me and asked me, how does it feel as a black person to watch that video? Because I absolutely refuse to watch it for the very same reason I don't watch the news. Although the blueprint for the correct course of action would not be created until several years later by Will Smith at the Oscars, I quit back that the experience was similar to the movie Avatar. My colleague looked at me in bewilderment as I further explained. In the 2009 film Avatar, there were humans and then there were the Navai. In the film, when one Navai dies, they all can feel it, which caused each of them deep pain because they're all connected. The wound is deep and the agony that reverberates through their body is indescribable. To bear witness to such brutality triggers an ache at the core of our being as a collective and regardless of socioeconomic status, 
education, Afrocentrism, age, position in life, or other factors the pain is felt. What I've witnessed since the murder of George Floyd and the pandemic, the strain from the pandemic, has been nothing but utter chaos for the mental health for both youth and families alike. I've seen students in poverty who have little structure in the home call for their parents to become highly structured distance learning experts. I've seen youth who've missed the developmental milestones from being at home for two years come to school as seventh grade freshmen and 10th grade seniors on the brink of being thrust into the world. I've seen educators turn advocates for the opportunity to better serve their students, piecing together curriculum and accommodations with the flexibility and nimbleness that would put the actors of Cirque du Soleil to shame. Community agencies have band together in collaboration to meet youth and families systemically. The ability to serve youth in a multi-systemic way in different capacities has been the sweet spot that I've seen work like magic. Running groups at Edison High School allows me to tap into the lives of students, but the most important thing is the pivot that my role as a mental health practitioner allows me to follow up and offer even more support. Now, I don't know about you all, but I sometimes lay awake at night pondering things in life, not only if indeed Netflix is going to stop password sharing amongst other households, but how on earth am I going to help all of these youth? Where I find hope in moments like this is having the opportunity to highlight in school and community resources that are making a dent in adverse issues that impact the mental health of youth, but also being able to appeal to the committee and allow more supportive adults to be representative of the population being served to make an impact in the life of youth. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gamage. Superintendent Lewandowski, always good to see you. Thank you for coming in today. We look forward to your testimony. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning. My name is Sandra Lewandowski. I'm the superintendent of Intermediate District 287. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to the conference committee about the efforts to respond to the crisis in mental health for Minnesota's children. I want to thank Chair Dabney and the House Education Committee for responding to this crisis, including the innovative mental health funding, which allows intermediate districts to provide for intensive mental health and behavioral needs of our youngest learners who are referred to setting for special education programs. I also want to thank Senator Chamberlain for foreshadowing the safe schools possible aid that might come out of legislation yet this session. And I also noted that conferees around the table represent so many school districts who over time, I can assure you, each of you have had students enroll in Intermediate District 287 programs. All of our children really are all of our children. I also want to thank former Education Chair Jennifer Loon, who first authored the two-year pilot program that we were funded for in 2017. While she could not have envisioned today's endemic mental health crisis, she represented one of our 287 member districts and came to one of my school sites to visit. As she left, she said, we do need to do something to address the needs of intermediate students, and she did just that. The two-year pilot partnership with the Wilder Foundation has proved that intensive mental health and trauma responsive work with our youngest, most traumatized students can and does help families and children become healthier. We know that all challenging behavior represents unmet needs. Our unmet needs in District 287 have had significant consequences for students and the emotional and physical consequences for students staff and families. I'm here to testify that these unmet mental health needs have become a public safety crisis for my district. And I would respectfully submit that I have been pleading with policymakers to take action about these issues for a number of years. We are all collectively responsible for addressing this public safety and children's mental health crisis. If not, I see our staff continuing to resign at twice the pace they have in recent years. And frankly, I think our state of Minnesota could end up subject to litigation around this issue. Let me just give you a few examples. We've had a teenager try to take their life by jumping off a second floor railing. She survived because a staff member was able to grab her arms with the help of others, pull her back up and over the railing. This same staff resigned shortly after that incident, due in part 
because of the trauma he experienced as a result and previous work-related concussions. A teen who was homeless brought a loaded weapon to school early this fall. His mother had pleaded that he stay in the group home where he lived and done well, but he was released and quickly became homeless and began reusing chemicals. He said he had the weapon for protection. One of our skilled ESPs talked and cried with me about how the incident had impacted her because of the gun violence in her own family and her fear that if she were killed at work, no one would be able to take care of her daughter. One of our finest teachers was punched in the face by a young student causing a concussion and injuries severe enough to require facial surgery. That teacher resigned. A staff member working with our very youngest students witnessed a violent episode of sexualized behavior and became significantly traumatized by its impact. Midwinter, a social worker came to me to talk about her fear that a high school student would continue their explosive behavior that often resulted in injuries to staff. She was explicit that even her experience in residential treatment did not compare to the experience she had with us in public schools. This social worker has now said she will resign. A single mother called to express her, express her displeasure with my decision to call a remote learning day because of bad weather. During the call, she tearfully told me that she was afraid to be alone, home alone with her teenager who has severe autism. And because his schedule would be disrupted, she feared he would become violent. She shared that her teenage daughter spends t all her time at home locked in her bedroom in order to be safe. The mother cried as she told me about the recent 911 call she had made that resulted in an ambulance transport to the ER where they told her they would not keep her son and that no crisis homes were available to place him out of the home. School was all she had. A local police department wanted to come to our school to arrest a young teen on felony charges. They didn't want to do it at grandma's house where he sometimes stayed because grandma feared for the safety of the youngest child in their home and the grandson had access to weapons. And finally, on February 1st, we became the first school in Minnesota to have a shooting that resulted in the death of a student since the Red Lake school shooting in 2005. February 1st will be forever burned in my memory and the memories of my colleagues in District 287. I can tell you that all the students involved in that shooting have had unmet needs for many years. Minnesota does not save money when we fail to provide appropriate mental health services. Students, families, and staff get seriously injured and traumatized, and if they can, they walk away from the danger, the fear, and the injuries. You may wonder how all of these incidents can happen. What is the district doing to address the issues leading to these situations? According to the Minnesota School Safety Center, we are doing everything right. The truth is that we can make the district as safe and secure as possible, but students with unmet mental health needs will seek to get their needs met in unhealthy, sometimes destructive and injurious and even lethal ways. Looking away from this crisis will not make it go away. Not investing in high quality, culturally relevant clinical mental health treatment is no longer an option for my school district. My first year as superintendent was indeed in 2005 when unmet mental health needs were apparent but not of epidemic proportions as they are now. Over my years as superintendent, I have seen the needs increase and services decrease to this my last year as a school leader in which I lost a student shooting outside of our school. I hope no other Minnesota school district has a similar tragedy, but is my belief we are a canary in the coal mine. If we do not provide children with the trauma responsive and mental health services they so desperately need, there will be more tragic outcomes. I urge you to reach an agreement that includes ongoing and clinically appropriate mental health services for the students we passionately care about in Intermediate District 287. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent, Superintendent Lewandowski. Uh, Chair Chamberlain, that's a powerful place to end today. I 
want to, before I hand it over to you, sir, I want to apologize to the uh, testifiers who we were not able to get to today. We hope to uh, pick up on Wednesday at 9 a.m. Uh, but, Chair Chamberlain. Thank you, uh, Chair. We will, uh, on Wednesday, we'll, on Tuesday, tomorrow, meet same time, same place, and we'll uh, do the walkthrough of the bills, side by sides. That's all I got, Mr. Chair. Okay. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Members, thank you for uh, your service on this committee. We are adjourned.